a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, Can Digital Save the Oil Sands? Some large oil companies are sending signals that Canada's oil sands may be heading towards an early exit. Can digital extend the life of oil sands a little longer? Well, you could be forgiven if you read a few newspapers and concluded that the oil industry has decided that the oil sands are not worth pursuing. Numerous reports place the oil sands high up on the cost curve of global oil resources, with their high capital costs and long timelines, suggesting that they may be among the first oil deposits to be stranded. Several high-profile global oil and gas companies such as Shell and Statoil have sold their oil sands investments to Canadian companies such as CNRL and Athabasca Oil Corporation. Many oil sands projects have either been cancelled, slowed down, or shrunk. Industry executives have openly speculated that some of the resource may not be produced, despite public policy to produce it all. Even Exxon announced that it was writing down the value of its oil sands investments to reflect the prevailing low oil price. Exxon rarely writes down its oil assets. On inspection, however, these are simply rational business decisions. I would observe that so far, at least for those companies selling, there's been a willing buyer. The price paid might not be as frothy as the values that the industry has seen in the past, but at least there's been a sale. The buyers obviously think the oil sands assets have value and therefore will be produced. Given that not all oil sands are created equal, some are easier and cheaper to extract than others, some oil will be left in the ground, but the buyers clearly think these particular assets are unlikely to be stranded. Otherwise, why would they buy them? And write-downs can often just be the result of accounting and regulatory policy, as has been the case involving Exxon. So are the oil sands even worth saving? Well, I like that quote from Canada's Prime Minister about the oil sands. No country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave them there. Quite correct, Mr. Trudeau. It is a fact that resources will always seek a market, and Canada's oil sands are no different. Entrepreneurs will find pathways for resources to get to market, sometimes in surprisingly creative ways. For instance, did you notice this clever bitumen shipping solution developed by that famous oil and gas infrastructure company, CN? Our dear Republican friends south of the border get it, and have permitted the long-stalled Keystone XL pipeline project to get going. The Republicans have also cleared the way for the disputed Dakota Access Pipeline to be constructed, a sure sign that American resources will also find a way to market. Energy system transitions do take a very long time to realize the shift from wood to peat, and from peat to coal, and from coal to oil, typically took 50 years or more to materialize. This makes sense to me. The energy system is in the very minutia of every element of our day-to-day existence, and we would all need to make specific and personal changes to move or shift our energy sources. It will take a couple of decades or longer to replace every car, truck, and train with something that doesn't use petroleum, along with all the refueling stations out there. So the oil sands could have value for 50 years or more. But if the oil sands are to survive, however, they must become as cost-effective as the next best alternative petroleum resource and as socially acceptable. Otherwise, all the investment will head to that lower-cost resource and simply starve oil sands from investment capital before the 50 years are up. And what exactly does that mean? Well, I think of it in terms of the five Ds. Decarbon, dewater, demand, de-waste, and de-villainize. Let's begin with decarboning. All businesses today are under pressure to to reduce their carbon footprint. Oil sands production generates more airborne carbon than other resources because it takes heat to extract the bitumen, and that heat is generated today by burning fossil fuels. On dewatering, water resources are under strain around the world, and while Canada is blessed with an abundance of water resources, oil sands extraction and processing uses water for both steam and separation and more water than what many communities and society can now accept. Now, as for demanding, despite the relatively few jobs in oil and gas, the industry is still designed around people, and the presence of people in a dangerous industry drives a high overhead cost in safety, training, equipment configuration, and housing, and the workforce commands high salaries as a result. And de-wasting. The oil and gas industry does not change quickly because of the hazardous 24-7 nature of its operations. As a result, work practices long abandoned in other industries 
live on in oil and gas and are now wasteful of resources. And last but not least, devillainize. The industry has lost its historic level of social acceptance and is now viewed as a villain in a world seeking to cool off. Since the industry will be around for another 50 years, it needs to reverse this perception. The digital revolution sweeping the globe can throw a few key lifelines to help the oil sands cope with the big Ds. Here's what I think are the critical few that can make the most difference. Number one is analytics. The biggest and most important lifeline digital technology is analytics. Not only do oil sands companies have mountains of data to work with already, it will be analytics that helps identify carbon reduction possibilities, water usage enhancement, social and community impacts, and general waste reduction. Fortunately, oil and gas companies have lots of analytical know-how. The data resource needs work to make it more reliable, more easily accessible, more transparent, but I would begin with setting an analytics strategy as an enabler to the other lifelines. Next lifeline is artificial intelligence. All that data, coupled with good analytics, is great, but is made even greater with automated decision-making, or what the digital industry calls artificial intelligence. AI is what can take many of the mundane and routine decision-making and related human response out of the business model permanently. That will also help reduce manning levels. Next key digital answer is smart assets. Inexpensive sensors that will make all kinds of invisible equipment visible. That is, sensors that broadcast asset whereabouts, operating state, and condition. That will reduce the need for human operators and inspectors, but will inflate data volumes and drive the need for better analytics. Next key lifeline is automation. To take people out of the field means a much higher level of automation than exists today. Aerial drones, a particularly good example of a smart asset, that supervise, inspect, and monitor field equipment from the air will provide solid leverage and reduce field resources. In time, equipment, plant, and vehicles will become automated. We can see the early signs in the form of the automated mining equipment. Anything with a chair in it today, and anyone whose job is to sit in that chair, is on a sunset path. Taking people out of the office is another demanding goal. In the office, the automation technology poised to make an impact is called Robotic Process Automation, or RPA. This automation technology mimics human keystrokes as they work with classic office tools like spreadsheets, as well as other corporate systems. RPA is coming soon to finance, field accounting, joint venture accounting, tax and royalty processing, compliance reporting, contract management, and a host of other repetitive manual processes. Another key lifeline is cloud computing. What makes the data, analytics, artificial intelligence, and automation come to life is cloud computing. All that data and compute horsepower needs a home. And there are now three huge cloud vendors, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, who have made enormous investments in green data centers, cybersecurity, and compute horsepower on demand. If banks can move their business to the cloud, so can oil companies. Next key lifeline is blockchain. The role of blockchain will be to transform key process chains in capital projects, sourcing, product sales, and compliance. The amount of waste in oil company process is still substantial even after all of the downsizing of late because the processes that incorporate wasteful practices have not been themselves transformed. Blockchain applications are the next big transformation tool to remove overhead costs from business processes. And the final key of lifeline is the ERP system. You might not think that a 30-year-old technology qualifies as digital, but the next generation of ERP systems incorporate the latest in digital technology, in-memory computing, cloud, analytics, mobility, and wearability. They will be profoundly digital and will unlock dramatic process and productivity improvements, provided companies are serious about taking full advantage of ERP capabilities. So in summary, will all these lifelines help transform oil sands into a zero water, zero carbon, people light, and highly efficient industry? Absolutely. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.